Uh, but once I can pull up assembly, we'll be good to go. That's it. I'm being technical. Yeah, but we had to check on that to be sure. Sure. Yeah, let's no, no, either no, way. Okay. I'll go down there and check, but I think I appreciate it. it should be okay. <laughs> Who handled this Jordan school? Such a response. You did? Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's, uh, it's under Drew. It is. Okay. And I copied Drew on the email. Okay. All right. Is everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Situated. This is the meeting. Move it down there. Is that cool? Good. Good. Okay. All right, we'll get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It is just a minute after three on March 15th. We are ready to begin our facilities committee meeting for the month of March. Um, I'm Chris Haggerty, the committee chair. We have in attendance committee members uh, Hershey, Caulfield, and Edmonds. So even though it's fewer folks than we usually see, that does constitute a quorum. We have 100% committee membership and will proceed. So at this time, I'll ask our committee members if they've had an opportunity to review the minutes from our February meeting. Yes. Yes. And if you have, then is there a motion? So moved Second. to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Okay, I've got a motion for Mr. Hershey to approve the previous meeting's minutes. I have a second for Ms. Caulfield. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right then. All right, so today as we begin, uh, we have a couple important presentations. Um, again, what we're really trying to do is uh, prepare you all with enough knowledge that when either important decisions come to you as a board member or when constituents come to you with questions about schools, facilities in general, you have the information you need either to answer the question or to direct them to the appropriate person who might be able to help them with, with uh, any problem that they have. So today we'll talk about facility needs, which is something I'm sure you've already heard about by now. We have a specific pro process in place that we'll learn about. And then we've already talked a little bit about uh, the cost model. We'll get an update. And then we'll bring back uh, the facility utilization report. Now we've seen this once since you've been on the board. Now that we have our new enrollment projections, we'll see any modifications or changes to that. This should not take the entire committee period. So we will have some time at the end for new business discussion. So several of you have suggested ideas or topics that we might want to look at in the future. This will give a chance to sort of give some notice to staff in advance that these are some areas we might like to see in a future presentation. Um, <coughs> get them thinking about it. We can talk a little bit about it and refine them. And then at that point, if we finish up early, we finish up early. If we have enough members to go into our closed session meeting later this afternoon, we can go ahead and get a jump on that and maybe get everyone home a little bit earlier. All right. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Ms. Sharp and our facilities team for Facility Needs Requests 101. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving me opportunity this afternoon to present the facilities needs process. I have with me today John Bevan, he's over there clicking for me. Um, he's the director of strategic projects, so that's what this falls under. We call all of our requests, that's our team, is called strategic projects. John oversees the team that's responsible for implementing projects that come from this program. The purpose of this presentation is to define a facility modification request, which maybe y'all have heard, back mod. That's what we call it. A partial renovation improvement project, which we call PRIMP, so if you hear us call PRIMP, and a space needs analysis project, which we call SNAP. We were also going to review the facilities needs request website, so we'll go to the site so you can see where that is. Give a few examples of requested projects that we've received and provide a summary of the projects that we have received so far through this new process. Um, a facility modification is a school, PTA, booster, or administrative department funded project. That is a modification to a building or to a school site. Examples of these can be educational gardens, 
batting cages, or even some workspace modifications. So not only school, but administrative. A partial renovation improvement project is a FDNC funded request submitted by principals to help bring older school facilities closer to current standards found in the learning environment guidelines, which we call LEGS. I know that's been some discussions. <laughs> Examples of these can be collaborative spaces, CTE program changes, magnet <coughs> school enhancements, and even scar carpool stacking modifications. A space needs analysis project is a FDNC funded departmental, district departmental requests that are non-traditional and or operational support space needs. Examples of these could be space for alternative learning programs, bus transportation regional centers, pre-K classroom additions, or administrative personnel growth. The facilities modification request portal was revised in January of 2022 to include the ability to submit print and SNAP requests. The revised portable portal was renamed Facilities Needs Request. The portal can be found on the Facilities Design and Construction website and training for its use was completed in February of 2022. Within this portal is a link to the facilities needs request form, which is the big pink box, a list of individuals that would typically submit a facilities needs request, project types defined with examples of each, and contact information for the individuals overseeing the submittals for each of the project types. The contacts are provided for support in the event additional assistance is required. Yeah. Listed is here, listed is the funding allocations for the print and SNAP program by years and millions. Print funding starts lower, increases through the next few years, which allows for the anticipated expansion of the print program. SNAP funding reflects the anticipated departmental space needs. So what we have found is some projects require additional design resources due to their complex scope and project schedules. These are defined as large projects. Others do not require the additional design resources and they are less complex and may have shorter durations and these are defined by small projects. So as you see here on this slide, these are our examples or a few of our examples of projects that we have received through the print process, through the facilities needs process. So here you have print and SNAP, and we have them defined as large and small. So in, su in summary, we have so far, since we have, since 2021, we have received 509 requests through this new portal. Well, through the portal. 329 requests were submitted during the 21-22 school year. 262 requests have been submitted since the start of the 22-23 school year. Since the portal revision, we had 108 print projects and SNAP projects, well, slash SNAP projects, have been submitted through the new um, portal. 59 print slash SNAP projects were submitted during the 2021-22 school year, and 49 print and SNAP projects were submitted to date the 22-23 school year. So that was a quick overview. So at this time, any questions, comments, I'll take. So I don't know if you had a chance to you know, look at any of the slides before the meeting or just as Ms. Sharp was going through, if you look at some of the examples, they answer a lot of the questions. You know, when you look at the, B, the, the first section, it says, well, you know, here's a project that could deal with crowding. Does this qualify or mm -hmm. does that qualify? Or here's painting a mural. What about just decorative painting? But then you go through and you see some of the examples that have been provided. I think it gives you a pretty good idea of the kinds of projects that we're looking at. Um, 
Does anyone have any questions at this time, either directly about the presentation or questions anyone has brought to you? Mr. Hershey? Um, where's the, the money going to come from for the expected increase in the PRIMP program? Where is the money coming from? It all comes from the same place, the uh, CIP. So we have that now, or, and we just don't use it? Because I, I got it. Yeah. So it's the annual funding. We get annual appropriations from the county. It's a seven-year plan of that annual appropriation. Okay. Okay. So what I can tell you, I think, is we've had SNAP and PRIMP funds as part of the line item in the CIP funding for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, we accumulated a few dollars for a bit because we didn't have a really strong process mm -hmm. to identify the difference between SNAP and PRIMP, and so we needed to sort of work through that. You know, we, were, we, we got the funding faster than we thought we were going to. The needs are bigger than what we have, so we had to have a process to really sort of funnel all of that through and prioritize. So you're, what you're seeing now is um, a better process. It continues to be evaluated and will be monitored to make sure it's meeting our needs, but we do have a steady stream of funding now that's coming into it that um, that our, our commissioners really agreed in our um, quest to balance renovations, um, brand new schools that are needed for growth, partial renovations, things that come up that we didn't think we needed right. that don't aren't necessarily part of seven year plan but we want to get done before seven years is done. That's where this stuff falls in. And really the difference here is um, snap and primp is they're paying for it, and anything that's a fact mod, the school and other partners help pay for it. Thank you. Thank you. So slide eight, how are we doing? <laughs> how? Like, do we have a backlog you, or? I mean, yeah, so with these that have come in right. since you revamped the how many are we're yeah. actually yeah. working on and, and how not many? exact but I right. mean how are we doing so everything on the slide John that showed the examples um, everything in that middle section we are working on um, we've got a few that we've got some feasibility studies going on so right now we've got quite a few projects that we are are in progress um, we have not since the process started completed any of them except for Nightdale Elementary School I think we just did a renovation project over there on their playground that is completed I think it's worthwhile to note a couple of things so we Elizabeth and her group uh, get in front of the principals once a year to share the process of course it's a new process now with the website that was created internally by FDNC staff. So they had the opportunity to get in front of the principals. There's also the opportunity that I've never been in a school, but I, I know that bookkeepers at schools are pretty important people. And so we get in front of the bookkeepers every year as well as a part of their training to make sure that they are aware of the process. One of the things that we're finding out as we're moving forward in all of this is that we are likely to run into some print projects that are larger than what we would typically want them to be. And so as we look at the seven year plan, as we look at the executive summary, which will be coming up for you all soon, um, we're looking for ways and opportunities to maybe identify those larger print projects and maybe move them up into the category of the, the existing school projects, just because they're so large. It's hard to fund a $15, $20 million print project out of the budget that we get. And so we're taking some steps now to better identify the scope of what we're planning. And by better identifying the scope, we'll be better able to identify the necessary funding. And so with those two steps, you know, the hope is that we might can identify some funding that we could use in other areas but all of that is dependent upon the scope that we find at the schools that we need to plan for in the, in the next eight to ten years and mark would, would brassfield be an example of a project that we, we thought was like a print but really was probably larger than it needed to be to order yeah, to be a print definitely yeah and because there were i mean i went i was out there not long ago and i'm like this was not a print project yeah. this is bigger than that and, and so on the list is uh, Broughton High School. So that's really a target 
project. We, we just that's going to be larger than what we can really handle within print. So again, we're trying to position ourselves to do some different things and be effective and efficient with the funding that we have. Thank you. Ms. Coffield, any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and just on slide seven here, I know you said some of these are in progress, some are like the Rock Quarry Road project, what's the status on that? So that is a feasibility study that we are doing on that campus to take a look at what those existing buildings currently have. I think there's a lot of space over there because we used to do business differently um, long ago. So we're trying to look at all the space over there and just be more efficient with that space. And if they have any needs from, it's an old campus. Um, and I know some of the buildings are outgrowing and some don't have as many. So kind of revamping on where people are located. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I follow up on that, Chris? Please. Is that related to the petition we got recently? Is that Some, that? That's that's Some one of the items in the petition. It's just been like the Part quality, of uh, yes. the age of the facilities. Absolutely. And, yes, absolutely. So this this should this should address some of the items in that petition. And, and just to note, I met with some of the staff out there and and meeting with them again soon, in the next couple of three weeks, to do two things. First of all, to listen but also to share with them some of the plans that are in place that maybe not all of them know about, such as this feasibility study at Rock Park. Yeah. Yeah. It, all these projects take time, mm -hmm. and it's good that things like this have already been initiated because we're starting now in the middle of a process as opposed to having to start from scratch. So that'll, that'll help a lot. Um, all right, well, if there's no other questions. One question. All right, Ms. Caulfield. Um, the prim is for like renovations, <clears throat> not additions, right? Just renovations to what is existing. Am I understanding that right? Well, I, I, I think it's a cost thing, right? <laughs> yes. I think it sets the intent, yeah. but they might evolve organically into something that becomes an addition if that's in the best interest. Yeah. Like you could build new parking, for example, right? Yeah. Or if you had. You, you don't necessarily have to replace something for it to like renovate. You could, well, yeah, I think you answered. I mean, if you're adding a, a wing and you're looking at spaces and egress and HVAC all new and all that sort of stuff, you're starting to run a little bit higher than what I think you might want in right. a print project. Right. But um, is there a certain dollar amount? <clears throat> so if you go to the slide that says how many you have, for how many dollars you have per year, print will eventually grow to 20, but right now it's around four or five million. There's not a lot you can do on four or five million. And we try to take all of these projects and um, run them parallel when the opportunity presents it with life cycle projects. You know, where we can combine and go to a site one time. So when there's that opportunity, we take advantage of it. I didn't mean to say that earlier, because life cycle is separate. There's other funds out there for different right. projects. Yeah. That's, that's what I was trying to see, if, if this was mixed with that or separate, like trailers, for example, that's not in here. So we have a, no, we have a separate line item for trailers leasing and, and removing. We were just talking about that earlier today. Um, we have a lot of moles. But like the history of the program, I think, and correct me on this, was we were trying to look for something with more flexibility to be able to address some of these important projects outside of like the seven year scheduled plan. life cycle mm -hmm. yeah okay okay all right well thank you miss sharp all right okay so we will move on to our 2023 cost model update you remember we introduced the cost model in committee previously explained what it was uh, the types of things that it covered uh, we went through Everything from like kitchens and all sorts of facilities. Now we'll have the update. And I believe um, Mr. Ma Mark, are you presenting that or Jack? Uh, Jack is. Yeah. Okay. The superintendent just asked me about it. It says uh, draft on the presentation. So we take this through the CIP team and our core team. And so we're, we're bringing it to you all now for review and discussion. It's okay. not a draft presentation, it's a draft proposal. Right. Right. Thank you. 
So they didn't upload the wrong one. That's right. They're, they're showing it while it's, that's that's, right. while it's still a draft. Okay. All right. All right. Good afternoon. Um, as we just learned, this is the uh, house model update for 2023. Um, presentation purpose and goals of the day. We're going to go over the model summary, kind of the annual process overview of what, what that entails, high-level market review. Um, we'll get into the CIP impacts and trends of 2022, and then how we're addressing those going forward. All right, so the cost model summary. What, what is the cost model? So essentially it is our um, major project estimating template. Um, and it includes the most, most of the um, costs are built into either direct construction costs, the site cost, or the building cost. That accounts for 75% of, of our major project cost. Um, the other 25% areas include geotechnical investi investigation, third party um, survey, and other third party services. Also, opening school funds, <coughs> including you know, FFE custodial equipment, child nutrition equipment, principal funds for um, instructional tech, instructional materials, so on and so forth. So the annual update process, what we want to look at with, with the annual update is to evaluate the accuracy. How, how were our estimates compared to what we experienced cost-wise? Um, can we afford the projects going forward? Do we need to make any adjustments? So we look at program changes as well, uh, market conditions, trends with the economy, and um, key areas that we evaluate. Or right, we look at the... Uh, design guidelines, the space standards, and other program changes. We look at the 2022 budget versus bid impacts. That's going to be the projects that bid last year. How were we estimate-wise compared to how bids turned out? Um, we look at risk analysis. We adjust for unique factors. Um, we also evaluate market conditions and, and what that leads to is adjustments into the inflation rates that are built into the model. All right. So looking at the uh, design guidelines, space standards, legs, and other program areas. All these are inputs into the cost model. And the cost model, the output of that, is our major project estimates, the budgets, essentially. So since 2021, there were no recommended material changes to these documents. That is, no scope changes were added. For instance, square footage is increased in the cafeteria or um, classrooms, or you know, irrigation added to the football. Those types of changes occurred um, prior to 2020. We've not had any since then, so these documents did not lead to any cost impacts. Uh, also this year, what we do have a slight reduction to a couple of items related to um, program and educational equipment, about a $350,000 decrease. And given these numbers are based off of a large elementary school model, so they'll be tailored and scaled to other projects. Media Center, $42,000 decrease. Um, it's basically opening day book collections. Um, since 2017, book costs have gone down $10 versus gone up. So all things being said, that's, that's a positive increase or decrease, so to speak. All right, moving into the market review, real high level. Um, since COVID hit, we've been in unprecedented volatility times led to high escalation that we hadn't experienced before uh, really anywhere. So what this means this year, various indicators are saying all kinds of different things. Experts can both, both say that we're in a recession and the economy is booming. Um, the Federal Reserve continues to um, increase interest rates and they'll do so until they see inflation is um, receding. They did another one this week. So looking at 2023, what that'll lead to from our business from the um, school's perspective is we hope that inflation will flatten, that these interest rates rising, there'll be less projects on the, um, out in the market, which leads to more competition. Um, second half of the year, we're, we're hoping to see, or the forecasts are, that overall demand is likely going to decrease again. What that'll lead to is higher competition at bid day, and the, the pace of escalation will flatten, if not receipt, going into late 2023, 2024. Let's say hope. 
All right, so these next two slides are kind of a refresh of last year where we were. Um, when escalation was really hit our industry and hit this group, this is how we dealt with the short-term risk and then also the long-term impacts. These for, this is looking at FY22 and 23. That was funded from a limited obligation bond. So at the time, funding was locked in. The increases we were experiencing for the projects that were funded with that, um, we, we couldn't go back to the county and say we need more money. So we had to fund that with existing savings and existing funds. Um, at the time, the potential cost exposure was about $85 million. Um, we identified $85 million uh, of funding that we had existing from um, several categories. A lot of it was from project savings, projects that closed. A lot of it was from projects that actually bid during COVID where we experienced a, a significant savings on bid day. Um, that was about 50% of these costs that we, we were able to come up with was due to those bids during COVID. Um, other included program contingency and project contingency for the projects, which those two items are intended to fund bid day overages and account for these types of costs. So the, the out years of last year's plan, FY24 through 29, those increases we in, included into the CIP with additional funding, a total of about $181 million, uh, was the average increase per project being about 10 million for elementary schools, 15 for middle schools, and high school about 25. All right, looking at this year, what this slide is showing is the two columns of what escalation was at for these projects in February, about this time last year, versus what we experienced over the course of the year. And so this, this is intended to show that while we, we had significant volatility this time last year, we continue to experience it over the course of the year, even more so. Now it's important to note that all of these um, increases we have already fully funded uh, through a reappropriation um, of funds. So, so the risk of these projects uh, not going forward is, is zero. All right, so what does that look like from a unit rate comparison? This is how we're adjusting our model this year to account for those costs. Um, is basically we thought the building was going to be about 260 per square feet um, and it ended up coming in at 287 on average for the two projects we had bid. Site cost about 575,000 per acre, came in about 643. Um, so slight deltas from what, what we had planned um, and what we had increased from the previous year where the majority of the increases were. So when you look at what the mechanism is inside the model to, to adjust for those cost increases, it's, it's this category, or this slide here, which is um, our inflation. And so it's tied, it's basically, um, I showed 2022 here to give you an idea of what the significant increase was for last year. And this year's increase um, is while it's about double what was existing, it's not as high as what we included. All right, so what does that look at from a funding perspective? Going into this year's CIP update, we're looking at the out years of the plan, FY26 through FY30. Um, the additional funding will be built into the CIP with um, a request from the county. Um, and based on the escalation rate changes from the previous slide, we're looking at about 2.2 million, about $5 million a project. Um, that includes four new projects and eight renovation projects. We have already vetted this through the CIP team and the joint core team, and the county debt team has already run it through their debt and capital model, and it aligns with um, their criteria so they can fund it. All right, so looking at the near-term risk, FY 24 and 25, these are funded from a GO bond, a general, general obligation bond, which was voted on back in November of last year. Um, we've got four projects that are funded um, it, it, within those fiscal years with the current cost exposure looking at about a range of 20 to 40 million. We've identified $53 million to account for that risk. Um, worst case scenario, it all hits. Um, those categories are program contingency from those two fiscal years, uh, project contingency for the projects listed. Again, those two categories are intended to cover these types of um, moves 
on bid day. And then also off-site reimbursements. We have about $25 million that are planned to come in from off-site reimbursements from past projects that have closed out that either the DOT or municipalities um, are reimbursing us for. All right, so wrapping that up, what we looked at today was the cost model summary and the process summary. We looked at a high-level market review, trends we experienced in 2022, and then the CIP impacts, short-term risk and long-term funding. Um, next steps are, um, well, this shows recent progress as well because this is in the past. In February, we uh, updated this to the CIP team and the core team, uh, also to the superintendent and chiefs for review and feedback. Today we're here at the uh, facilities committee meeting, uh, this group for review and feedback. And then April and May, we will take this um, cost model and put it into the uh, CIP um, executive summary and um, take that, bring that forward to the uh, working sessions and facility committees in uh, April and May. Any questions, comments, or feedback? Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I had a couple questions just to start us off. Um, the first one is just more of a technical one. If you can go back to, I think it's slide 13, you're looking at the uh, CIP 24 and 25. Identify the, the four new projects and one renovation project. If you can just clarify, when we passed the November 22nd bond, we identified a large number of renovation projects at several other schools. So because they're not listed there, does that mean that the bond funding is just for like planning and design or where are, just further down the timeline, where are those other projects? So these are the four projects that are bidding, bidding plan through these two years, um, bidding or funding plan. Um, one, two, three, four, Lockhart, yeah. So if you look at the bond window, we also have funded uh, Pleasant Plains Elementary, Bowling Road, there, there's several others listed that this is not an impact. We just can't go for more funding or build the funding for this need into the um, CIP plan. And they're bidding within the years where we're funding is locked in. So that's why these are called out that way. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, you know, for example, like Athens Drive was one of the projects we've talked about. Their improvements to Ligon Middle School Correct. and others. And just because they're not listed here, I was just asking for clarification. Where are they in the process? Sure. So they're in those two years, Mr. Haggerty. Okay, they're in those two bond years. Those are indeed design dollars, like you indicated. And as Jack indicated yeah. in his response, they're not bidding. So they're not reflected in this deck. But yeah. they're they're in those two years. They're in our CIP. They're, they're in, in our timeline. That is correct. They're just not in this bidding process. Yeah, this is, they, they don't need money for those two years for this, right. which is why. Okay. For construction. So the costs associated with the other, other renovations are not out to bid, so they're not on this slide. But there are other costs that are not part of that. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I guess I have a, a, a big question that's um, a little more existential, if you'll forgive me. But we take the cost model and you bring it and you present it to the board. Why do we do that? Short, uh, short answers, informational purposes. Mm -hmm. So we, it's important for you all to know everything that goes, or the behind the scenes work that goes into preparing the budgets that you do see for the projects that we bring to you. And so this is the behind the scenes work um, of looking at cost trends, looking at recent costs, projecting where we're going. These are the building blocks that allow us to put those bigger budgets together. These are the foundational elements of it. So I know sometimes when we bring these, you know, we'll ask questions and then we'll like solicit board input. But if you look and go back to the first slide, we haven't changed the cost model in several years. Uh, well, and, and let me go back. I, I want to say that. I want to make sure that I state right. that accurately. The actual slide, there were no recommended material right. changes 
in the CIP documents 21, 22, and 23. Right? So that's referring to the design guidelines, the legs, and the space standards yes. specifically for those three, which, which kind of drive the scope of the project. So yeah. the space standards has the square footage and the classrooms and design guidelines and legs, you know, include you know, specifics about, uh, you know, technical details. Right, and, and that's, that's, that's what I want to focus in on with my question. We'll give a lot of input around the board table, and just in my tenure, I can name several items. We've talked about kitchen design, like, the, you know, incorporating the flexibility, you know, our older schools have dishwashers or spaces for dishwashers. More modern designs have taken those out, but there's been moves of you know, looking at the cost effectiveness. Do we want it in? Do we not want it in? If we had the flexibility, maybe we would have that choice. Safety improvements, like vegetables, things like that, that are sort of changes in maybe what we were looking at in a template a few years ago. Design features, collaborative spaces, whether we have lockers or don't have lockers. Uh, sustainability features in terms of like solar and geothermal and things like this. When we talk about those, you know, we give that feedback, but I guess what I want to know is that, is that like a level of micromanagement where we can all talk about them, but that's not actually going to go into the formula when you start talking about the construction and design costs? Is it, or I just, I, I don't want us to spend our wheels and to set like, Unrealistic, and that might be a, a question for the superintendent or for Mr. Strickland. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just want to like set reasonable expectations in the process, so we don't come back here and say, "Well, hey, what happened to my yeah. kitchen design, or so, what happened to my so lockers?" Do we, have, do we have annual review of the legs also, right, and the design guidelines? So we have annual review of design guidelines and legs. So during those conversations, if there is sufficient energy from the board that this is something that needs to happen or doesn't need to happen and it causes us to change those design guidelines or space standards or legs as they're called then then we incorporate that moving forward once you know we have that discussion and, and that has to be a back and forth because staff might say uh, no you may want to do that but with this is this is why this, this is not cost effective yeah. or your it's a large cost for a small impact and your dollars are better spent in this other place please stop me anytime I say something really wrong um, but, uh, but that is the space where really the board input about changing the things that we do happen. And so when you see on slide five, no changes, no cost impacts, that means that we haven't made any changes that will cause, that will cause the project to cost more. But there may be cost impacts through other factors that are going on due to inflation or the, the job market, the labor market, whatever it might be, right. that you see later on in some of the increases in terms of how much more it's costing to build an elementary school or middle school or high school. So, so could 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 a could a uh, like an improvement or recommendation been adopted, but then other offsetting changes could have been made so that it's not a change in the actual cost. So 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 an, a perfect example there I think and I think these conversations sometimes happen in the core team is should we re-examine how much square footage we have in our classrooms, right? So <laughs> I've been waiting to jump in. Okay. Right. So Elizabeth is going through a process right now and so from where we stand, where we sit, everything begins with academics, the academic program. So Elizabeth is going through a process right now with academics and others to talk about our space standards because um, we need to continuously evaluate those. I mean, we may have some ideas about what we want to change and cut, but we wouldn't do it without the input and, and agreement from academics. She's literally going through that now and has been, and the result of that will be as we vet it through our internal processes you all will see eventually what those discussions ended up being about and what recommendations we will make. And so, um, you know, the size of certain spaces, classrooms, media centers, collaboration spaces, again, Elizabeth is going through that process now. Um, we've also had some really good staff development days with some of the architects that work with us, and essentially they come in and critique what we do particularly in comparison to other districts throughout the state where they may work. And so we're, we're trying to put together a, a, a more condensed plan of what we think we can do and still satisfy our needs. Because 
every square foot is, as Jack pointed out, $276. So I appreciate that. Really what I'm just looking for is making sure that everyone is clear, we set reasonable expectations, and we have transparency. Sometimes with facilities, it can seem like we just have this black box, and everything goes in, and we don't see what comes out. And so being able to explain, you know, we all know about inflation, we all know about supply chain issues. I think nobody is surprised to see the building costs go up, the site costs go up. But just knowing that there is this process of review really helps. I'll, I'll just throw one more log on that fire. Um, we have a community and commissioners that for many years have been very receptive and understanding of the needs that have been communicated and that has been demonstrated through the bond votes that have been passed. If we were in a different situation uh, with either the relationship with the commissioners or the community around the kinds of costs and not in an area that is a great place to live and work and that sort of thing, we might be in a very different situation in terms of being required or uh, to make changes to our legs or design standards or other things in order to keep within constraints that may be put upon us and, because we don't fund ourselves. So, I just need to shout out to the community and the commissioners there. I think we'd all echo that. All right, so uh, sorry to monopolize the questioning. If there's any other committee questions going around, Mr. Hershey. So on slide six, you talk about market volatility, and then you kind of, and then there's kind of a there's a 2023 forecast that inflation will at least flatten. That is the hope. And. How how many years in advance? Because then you go to slide eleven, and it the revised is significantly less. It's down to three point five percent again. How much can how how far in advance, or, or when do you look at that again to potentially revise? Right. So we look at it every year as part of the annual update process. It continues. It, it, it provides a lot of flexibility and opportunity to make changes as we learn as trends happen throughout the year. Um, so every year we come in and make recommendations based on the trends for whatever year it is. Um, but ideally, ideally, the hope is that we move back into a stable market. I mean, is it safe to put 3.5% revised in 2024? That is, that is based on the best available information currently. So the revised Revised for 23 is 8% and 15%. Guess. Yeah, and 24, is, it goes back to the 3.5 and 7%. But subject to change based on information right. that we glean between now and then on right. actual bid information and where the market is. Okay. So is it, is it accurate to say that current is what we've budgeted for, revised is what we anticipate needing to budget for, and then the delta happens when it happens? Correct. Because even what we see in estimates can vary until midday, until the minute that they have to submit their actual bid. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason then not to anticipate higher than what we have, or is that already built in based on? So it, it, the higher is, I guess, built in based on the 2022 update. If you, if you see the 22.5% and 15%, right. we, we, it's shown in 2022, but really that's accumulation of everything that group to that point and so everything after that point is also escalated based on that increase and so it, it gets into a little tricky math uh, when you look at the out years but it, it is built in there essentially and then why not increase it even more just to be you know a little more conservative and, and over right. it's it goes back to the county funding model and what they okay. can and can't afford and, and us working through them with the joint core team we're very transparent with them about what we're seeing numbers wise right. Um, and they even, they, they use a lot of our numbers in their models as well. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, further questions? I have a couple. Ms. Caulfield. Um, so what we're talking about in this presentation is the funds towards the buildings, correct? Um, well, it's all the major projects, so it's all of the capital improvement funds. The majority of the cost is direct construction, um, but there's also uh, program costs including that's not really represented in the cost model, which is specific to a major project, but um, it's also cost for opening new schools that go to supplies and equipment of the academic nature. So what is the total that we received in the bonds? 660 million, I think was, yes. Some of that's cash, right? 20% cash, 80, 80 20 percent split. 
So how much of that portion goes into what you're breaking down here for like the buildings and stuff that we're, how does, how does that work out? I guess that's more of a 101 question. Cause so we have different categories. We have okay. new construction projects, existing construction projects, and then we have our program requirements category. Um, and you all will see this in detail uh, coming up in, a, in the next meeting or two. So the, the whole CIP, uh, while today is focused on construction costs, there are other costs in that CIP, that executive summary that we pay for. So with new schools and additions and renovations, we also pay for life cycle projects. We have ADA projects, land, technology, security, temporary classrooms. There are lots of other categories that are supported by the CIP and the bond. So just back to the, the numbers of your question, around 530 is what million is what the voters voted on, and the additional 130 is the 20% that's cash. cash. And to break it down for major category, you're looking at about 298 million of that is program line items. 273 million is for new schools. 91 million is for existing schools and renovations. Can you say that again? Sure. 298 million for program. 273 million for new schools. And 91 million for existing schools. And um, <clears throat> just for my information on chart 11, FF and E, what did that say? Furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And the total breakdown for the bond was 530.7 million. That was the bond piece, and then the cash piece is 134 million. Totaling 664.7. Um, earlier in the presentation you said all site reimbursements um, that that actually came back to us like what what is what is that about? So there was a law change in 2017 that requires the DOT and municipalities to pay us back for any required off-site um, scope that they request it's not what they require um, and so prior to that there was they piled on the work with us thinking the school system would pay for all that work um, and so the law was passed, and now they have to pay us back. And so that's kind of the backlog of what existing projects were. So basically, money they didn't spend. It was money we spent on their behalf. There were requirements that we were advised to do. Right. Okay. And then, by virtue of the law, that DOT has to reimburse, or the municipality has to reimburse the school district. It, it is really important to have very good relationships with those municipalities, but you know they may want. A stoplight or a sidewalk or a turn other a what a turn lane yeah yeah like into and, the site yeah and so and we might be saying I we don't think we need that but they control the permits and 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 the rules on some of those things and so uh, the law was put in place really to sort of um, protect districts and the counties that are funding school districts from municipal asks that may exceed um, what might be required uh, but again that's still a collaborative process where we want to as much as possible agree so is it is it a thing so municipalities put that upon us but and then kind of reimburse us for it they do now okay because of that one yes okay all right just wanted to understand all right, thank you. Ms. Evans? Thanks. So would you please walk me through again slide 13? I knew when I saw this um, last night as I was looking at it that, for example, Washington Elementary and Athens Drive didn't disappear from the bond that right. was passed. But um, can you explain again? I, I apologize for making you repeat yourself. Um, but can you explain again why they're not here? They're, they're money for them is so that they, there's they're not bidding they're not far enough along or even have started some of those projects that are um, funded within the bottom and haven't even started design yet right to know if they're going to need it um, we built in the escalation calls for those projects you know last year into the plan because they're so far out in the out years um, and so the projects listed here are in design we have estimates for them that are showing a range of 20 million to 40 million over what we currently have funded knowing that they're going to bid within these two years that we are locked into funding we had to come up with an alternative source or you know reduce the scope which we don't we don't want to do 
So peeling back that, we look at all the other sources of funding um, to cover that risk. Um, the risk is mostly with the construction portion of mm -hmm. it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we know what the design fees will be. Okay. And then when you describe um, new schools versus existing schools, major renovations, my understanding is that both of those schools are expected to be completely rebuilt. Not and that may, well. you may not, we should not have that discussion here today, but a bigger question is, um, when we when we use the term new school, yeah. are we are we do we always mean a school that does not exist currently? We don't mean even if we right. Right. level a building and for, rebuild. That's for not the most a new part. School. Yeah. Okay. So Wendell Elementary is a school that is identified as a new school. It is an existing school, obviously, um, but it is listed in the new school category because okay. it will be a totally complete new school. Right, and I guess that's where I'm thinking of, like, from the from the money standpoint. You know, if you knock a building down and rebuild it, that is okay. But for example, like York and Stow and some of those, those would have been renovation projects, or those have been better replaced, right? So they're new in the sense of the physical sense, but not new in the enrollment sense, right? That's all. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. We'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the 23-24 projections on the facility utilization report. And we welcome back Ms. Rory. Thank you. Projected 2023-24 Facility Utilization Report. Today we will give you high-level overview of the changes to the 2023-24 FER with the projected memberships, which is attached as backup to this presentation and will answer questions. These are some of the terms that you're now becoming familiar with as we've shared them in recent presentations and we've included them again today, excuse me, as they are important to understand how they relate to the firm. I would like to reiterate the importance of a few of those, ADM, PMR2, and enrollment. You'll probably be tired of me hearing me say that over the next couple of years. ADM, or average daily membership, is subject to attendance violations whereas enrollment is the total number of students who are enrolled at a school regardless of attendance violations. An enrolled student is not counted in the ADM after 10 consecutive unexcused absences, otherwise referred to as an attendance violation or a violation of the 10-day rule. PMR2, our principal's monthly report is month two of the average daily membership. This number is used for district budgeting for the school year and the official annual FER publication, which is typically released in December. During any standard school year, the enrollment numbers are generally higher than the ADM and the PMR2. We would like to reiterate again that the funding for the number of students enrolled above PMR2 is not identified in our base funding request and must be identified from other sources. We want to continue to reiterate the purpose of capacity models, which explains the capacity that you see reflected in the firm. School capacity is the underlying metric for determining crowding, new school locations, 
membership forecasting, and CIP planning. Each new school construction or renovation project that is brought to the board for approval at schematic design is designed for a specific capacity and follows a specific capacity model. The capacity model defines the number and types of classrooms and the number of students or capacity and the planned use of each classroom in the brick and mortar building at each school. The example elementary capacity model on this slide shows the capacity classrooms above the line, the red line, and the non-capacity classroom spaces below the line. Crowded schools that need more capacity spaces utilize non-capacity spaces from below the line to accommodate capacity classrooms above the line. For example, a crowded school that needs an additional first grade classroom could use an available non-capacity classroom from below the line to accommodate an additional class if, if it's needed, if that space is on the first floor. In this scenario, the school's capacity does not change, but the utilization would then be above the assigned capacity and would reflect a higher crowding number. Capacity, non-capacity, and retired trailers are viewed in a similar manner as the brick and mortar building, and their uses affect the campus capacity at schools as reflected on the firm. Similar to the capacity model shown here, capacity models for elementary and middle schools also reflect the traditional and multi-track year-round capacities. The CIP planning assumptions confirm that new elementary and middle schools are constructed utilizing a schedule that permits them to open on multi-track year-round calendars. For new schools, the Board of Education will typically make a decision on whether to open the elementary or middle school as a traditional or multi-track year-round closer to the time of the school opening. You've heard us discuss the impact of the K-3 class size legislation during recent presentations. This legislation dictates the number of students per class in grades K through three, which affects our capacity at our elementary schools. There are no legislative limits on the number of students in fourth or fifth grade classes or middle school and high school classes. Monitoring the size of classes at each grade level is important to ensure compliance with the legislation and to avoid overcrowding at individual schools. The information on this slide reinforces the importance of controlling class size in kindergarten and first grades. If we allow the 2018-19 kindergarten class to grow too large at a specific school, the next year, we would need an additional classroom and teacher at first grade in order to accommodate the increased number of students aging forward and the reduced class size at first grade. We can request waivers to accommodate a plus three student in individual classes, but we must maintain the, an average of 18 with no more than 21 students at kindergarten an average of 16 with no more than 19 students for first grade, and an average of 17 with no more than 20 students for second and third grade. Even with the flexibility that a three plus waiver provides, we must meet class size averages for grades K through three at each individual grade level across the district. This legislation impacts the school facilities transportation, student assignment, teacher allotments, budget, etc. And we want to keep reiterating that because I know you've heard about the transportation challenges. So, New schools are typically not open at full capacity. They open at an adjusted percentage per your slide until they are at full capacity in either years two or three. 
Our high schools, for example, typically open with ninth and 10th graders, and then they age forward until the school is at full capacity in the third year. The fur is formatted to reflect crowding based on the design capacity in the brick and mortar building and capacity trailers. This format helps provide consistent reporting of data and reflects the maximum flexibility to accommodate area growth. Schools are grouped by category, elementary, middle, high, and alternative schools. Following the school code and school name, you will see the student membership number, the building design capacity, as, excuse me, as explained in slide four, the number of capacity trailers, the school crowding percentage with capacity trailers, and lastly, the non-capacity and retired trailers. Now we would like to highlight some of the changes to the 2023-24 FIR. For elementary schools, a new cap was placed on one school, Apex Friendship Elementary School. Two schools will increase to 100% capacity in year two, Apex Friendship Elementary and Barton Pond Elementary. One school moved to a swing space with an increased capacity, Baucom Elementary School at Woods Creek Elementary. And we just wanted to note, when Baucom Elementary returns to its main campus, it will have the same increased capacity that they are currently realizing at the Woods Creek campus. And I would like to make a correction on the next item. There are actually two schools that will have reduced to uh, capacity due to trailer removals. One is Fox Road Elementary and one is Timber Drive Elementary. And the, oh yes. Sorry, just to be clear, when we, you're using capacity on this slide, you don't mean that the school will be at 100% utilization. Correct. It's the difference between moving from a new school opening to the standard utilization model, is that yes. right? Yes, so if you were looking at high schools Typically, we don't have our 11th and 12th graders right. move to a different school. So the capacity that would be reflected at a brand new high school would only be 50% because you're only expecting to have your 9th and 10th graders there. I just wanted to be clear on that so you didn't yes, have people sir. really upset that we just opened these schools and they're already full. That gotcha. happens, but not with these right now. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I was doing a correction for uh, Fox, Road. Fox Road and Timber Drive Elementary will have a reduced capacity due to trailer removals. And those new capacities are reflected correctly in the fur that's attached as backup for this presentation. The cap was removed from one elementary school, Sycamore Creek Elementary. For middle schools, Herbert Aikens Road Middle School will increase its capacity to 80% in year two. For our high schools and alternative schools, an additional score location will open in Raleigh, and for those of you who are not uh, familiar with that term, second chance online resources for education. So we'll have an additional score location that will open in Raleigh. We also, one correction here, we also will have one high school that will have an increased capacity due to a trailer placement, which is Heritage High School. That is also reflected accurately in the FIR, which is back up to this presentation. So we're placing the CIP number of six trailers on that campus. And I think this front has actually left on its left. <laughs> But um, he assured me that that will be available, so we went ahead and made that adjustment on the firm. The Wake Early College of Information and Biotechnologies will increase capacity in its second year. The additional component of the school will open alongside Parkside Middle School on the Parkside Middle School campus, shared campus in the future, which right now is projected to be 2026. Willow Spring High School will be in its third year and therefore its capacity will increase to 100%. We have determined that showing the visualization of the fur is very helpful for understanding crowding. This graph 
represents the current crowding levels at our elementary schools. Schools that have four trailers, as specified in our CIP program assumptions, are noted with small icons. And schools with more than four trailers are noted with large icons along with their calendar assignments. School locations without trailers are noted with a circle only. The white spaces show area of crowding of less than 90%. The yellow spaces show area of crowding of 90% to 100%. The peach spaces show area of crowding of 100% to 110%. And the red spaces show area of crowding of over 110%. This graph represents the current crowding levels at our middle schools. Schools that have the six trailers as specified in our CIP program assumptions are noted with small icons. Schools with more than six trailers are noted with large icons along with their calendar assignments. School locations without trailers are noted with a circle only. The color coding is the same as the elementary school color coding ranging from white spaces with area crowding less than 90% all the way to red spaces with area crowding of over 110%. This graph represents the current crowding levels at our high schools. Per our CIP program assumptions, high schools have the same six trailer specification as the middle schools. High schools with six trailers have small icons, and those with six, excuse me, more than six trailers have large icons along with their calendar assignments. School locations without trailers are noted with the circle only. Similar to elementary and middle schools, the color coding ranges from white spaces of, with area crowding of less than 90% to red spaces with area crowding of over 110%. The FER is published twice a year, once in March with projected student allotments, and typically once in December based on the actual PMR2 student membership reported to DPI. The FER data is used to support many efforts. The data helps us monitor compliance with class size legislation, is used to determine when a school may need to be capped, and when there are issues with how a building is being utilized. <coughs> Consistency in expectations and equity in how a building can and should be used is necessary to support long-range student assignment needs and to plan for the growing needs of the district. As backup to this presentation, you have a copy of the 2023-24 FER with the projected membership. You have the 2023-24 FER with projected membership sorted by board member and the elementary, middle, and high school crowding maps so that you're able to zoom in on those. Thank you for your time, and we're happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rory. I want to thank you, too, for we've seen these heat maps before, but adding the new school sites on here I think is really informative so you can see in a lot of these areas with high growth, we have, in many cases, a school that's you know on the way, yes. part of the CIP, and will help to alleviate that crowding. Okay. So um, again, I know by now you all are veterans when it comes to facilities utilization. <laughs> you know the concepts. Uh, you've seen the updates, though, based on some of the recent enrollment numbers. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Rory at this time? I do. OK, Ms. Caulfield. Um, there was a lot of circles on here, indicating a lot of trailers, my favorite. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> how many of the trailers actually do get removed because, as I understand it, they are temporary <laughs> solutions, correct? So how many actually do get removed in the end? Okay, I'm going to answer this question in a couple different ways. Um, <laughs> we did a Trailer 101 presentation. It was a huge group of us uh, because it involves uh, not only long-range planning, student assignment, uh, facilities design and construction, it, it, and maintenance and operations. It includes across the board uh, a lot of groups. 
One thing that you've heard uh, continuous reference to is the line items on that uh, CIP executive summary. And I think just a few minutes ago there was a reference made to that as a line item. One of the things you'll notice for temp classrooms is that the budget for that line item ranges somewhere between 2.7 million to about 3.4 at its highest. Similar to the comments that were made in reference to PRIMP and SNAP just a few minutes ago, that money only goes so far. So where you saw the notation or the, the notes I uh, referenced earlier where we're removing trailers at Fox Road Elementary, we are repurposing those at another site. The trailers that we are removing at Timber Drive, Timber Drive had a, a number of leased units we are returning all of the leased units. We are leaving one capacity trailer on that site and we're repurposing the, the remaining trailers on that site. I don't have bid numbers yet and like I said, Mr. Bevan has uh, gone so I know he's in the process of getting all of that sorted out right now. It is our anticipation that that placement for Heritage High School will completely exhaust the funding available for the 22-23 school year. So, for the 23-24 school year, I already have placements in place, and when I come back to do updates of projected changes next year, you'll see that placement, because I'm, not, I'm expecting those trailers to be on the ground during the 2023-24 school year, but not in time for the start, so we would not show or re reflect and increase capacity until they are on the ground and up and operational. So that will more than likely be the 24-25 school year for that second placement. And I don't know if I named the school for that, but it's uh, Roseville High School. So um, about a year and a half ago, the last bid we had, I think it was for a seven classroom uh, trailer placement, ran about 1.7 million dollars so while we are working on trailer removals it's really hard when capacity dictates that i or lack of capacity dictates that i need to do placements ahead of removals however balkan elementary when balkan elementary swings into woods creek and elizabeth comes excuse me the shark comes in and completely demolishes um, that existing campus we are repurposing some of the units on that site. Some will be demolished if they're much older. Uh, one of the things we had shared in that trailer 101 is that a good portion of our trailers are at or above their useful life. The units we take from one campus to another, uh, Mr. Bevan will go through and completely rehab those. So while it might be a 35 year old unit, <coughs> it will actually not look like a 35 year old unit whenever he's finished. So what's the what's the cost of repurposing a trailer? All of that goes into the example I gave for the seven classroom uh, relocation, all of that would be in that 1.7 million dollars. So it allowed us... One trailer? No, no it was uh, seven. So you're saying that they're putting um, trailers on Heritage High School and yes. also putting trailers on Rollsville High School. Correct. So we're going to see more circles on the map. Right? You will. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, um, but you will see reduction, well, a smaller uh, circle for Timber Drive because they'll drop below four. And then you'll see a smaller circle for Fox, well actually no, Fox Road will still be a large circle because I think it ended up being four capacity and four non-capacity that are sitting, that will still be on that side. Can I save my questions for later or just? Yeah, because we're going to jump right into that. And so we'll just save that okay. for more of the kind of trailer discussion. A lot of what I had was mostly about like the trailer and the cost, but I think we're going to yeah. talk about that. So okay. I'll, I'll hold. Hold on. Anything Hold on. else, please? <laughs> anything else directly related to the facilities utilization in Ms. Roy's report? Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Ms. Roy. Oh. oh, I'm so sorry. I thought we were getting ready to talk some more about trailers. <laughs> I'll, I'll, what we're going well, to do, we have a new business calls. section, so don't leave the room. Yeah, so You're we, still we on might call. Bring you back. Okay. You, might said, need to, you might need to call for backup. <laughs> but, 
what we'd like to thank do, you. thank you. What I'd like to do is, enter, if you all will entertain it, a quick flip flop on the agenda. Let's go ahead, and if we can get um, Douglas to come up and get the give the three month facilities forecast, sure. we'll do that, and then we can have a protracted new business discussion um, where we can talk about. We've talked about trailers. I've talked with Ms. Caulfield about some other topics we want to discuss. I know Mr. Hershey has had some items that we want to sort of get notice for in Ms. Edmonds. As the other committee member here, you will have <laughs> free opportunity to get all your uh, topics thrown out there for discussion as well. I had to share all that like I have for me. All right. So, Mr. Congdon, if <laughs> we'll you are ready, if you just want to walk us yep. through the next three right. months. So, scrolling down to March 21st, which is our next board meeting, I think of particular note will be uh, bringing you the design contract for North Garner Middle School, which will be the first of the next round of the schools coming. <clears throat> Looking further down at uh, April 11th, as indicated earlier by Mr. Strickland and by, by Jack, uh, we'll be bringing the executive summary to you all at the work session on April 11th. And we headed to April. A little further. Uh, facilities uh, will be on the 19th that month, given spring break earlier in the month, and we plan to bring a maintenance and operations 101 to you all. We'll be doing a review for the CIP 2023, and we'll also be discussing uh, the top 25 privatization list again, as we discussed last month. Let me go down into the second board meeting at the end of April. And we'll be bringing you uh, GMP for Parkside Elementary, I'm sorry, Middle, excuse me. And uh, this is the Combo Middle High School uh, of note. And then we will also be coming to, planning to come to the work session with respect to the CIP and the resolution approval like we did last year. So that would be the current game plan. Uh, looking a little further into May, Felton Grove High School, GMP number four. And then in May, Facilities Committee meeting, a 101 for land acquisition. Any questions? Do we have a copy of this in here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why am I not seeing it? It's, um, it's a three month forecast. Am I not scrolling far enough? DCM9. Oh. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. And um, do, you, do you foresee between now and June any design schematics or anything like that? that no, so everything that's in process that's this next round that's coming, we're anticipating being ready to come back to you all uh, Q4, so like in the, in the fall, end of, the end of 2023. Okay. okay. All right, any questions on the forecast? All right, thank you, Douglas. Sir. And so with that, you see the facilities planning calendar. Um, you'll see our committees in addition to the CFP and the budget work. But this leads us, or this transitions nicely into our new business phase where where we will have committee discussion coming up you know each month we have some topics we absolutely have to hit on you'll see 2023 CIP review in April um, you'll see we're planning some more like 101s to kind of introduce some of these topics like to hear a little bit more about land acquisition to hear a little bit more about our maintenance and operations um, but if there are other topics which you have interest in where you have questions, I'd like to use, you know, like the next, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes, 20, 30 if we need it, just to kind of go through and, like, hear from you about some facilities-related topics um, where we can ask some questions right now, but if it's something where we need, like, a more, in, more information, a more advanced presentation, this will give you a chance to kind of like ask specifically what you'd like to see so staff has time to research it and bring it back so we can get some deeper answers to some of these questions. So we've heard a little bit about trailers. Ms. Caulfield, do you want to get into like some specific questions sure. to get out there? And if there's a simple answer, we can address them. And if not, this is something we can bring back at a future meeting. So kind of brought it up in the past and I think it's just kind of like sticking side um, with all the trailers I mean even just we just got presented with the new um, school in Roseville 
and it's with the intention on the map of where the trailers will go in the future if we need it. So my thought was instead of doing the trailers, why are we not like preparing for an extension instead? Is there a way to uh, explore that or is it cost? Is it like, it, it just seems like with safety measures and just the flow of the students going in and out of buildings, you have your, um, you know, you have to pay attention to your handicap accessible. Sometimes you have two entrances, some have bathrooms, some don't. Like there's just so much inconsistency and safety issues. So is there a way to explore doing, and when I said in the last meeting, I was meeting more like a, when I said modular, not like something that was built off of the school if it's needed where we have the space instead of the trailers. Because obviously if we have the trailers, we have the space to build something. And if we're spending, say we have seven trailers and we're spending $7 million to put that on there, and that needs maintenance and it needs replacement or it's inconsistent. We may need it, we may not need it. Having an extension off of the school seems like it might be more of a permanent solution. All good, great, fair questions. Um, obviously trailers are a lot less expensive and uh, we can get those done quicker than we can a new building. So in the case of I think Heritage High School when the site plan was submitted some time ago there was a plan submitted back when the school was built of where the trailers would be located. So with that in mind it makes it easier for us to go and, and say to the municipality yeah, this is where we planned on them going. Um, we did have a discussion internal with staff about the idea of, of building, you know, additions and things like that. Um, and, and we can further explore that. But in, in terms of flexibility, cost, and speed, you know, trailers, that's, that's why they're there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many times once we put them at a school, you know, they stay there. But we're looking into that and we will look at opportunities where if, if we can build something, we will. But again, um, that's a much more expensive proposition than, than the route we're going now. I do also want to say that, I mean, trailers are far less expensive than planning to potentially build an addition onto a building. And Heritage, as an example, and they're not always this neat as, as examples, Heritage has been open 13 years and will have been open 15 years before they get their trailers. So the, the population of the school was managed through capping, potentially reassignments, another new school opening like Rollsville High School. So the time period between when Heritage opened and potential crowding solutions happened actually allowed for the entire building of a whole other high school before they ever got trailers. So so it's it's a it's a more cost-effective, cheaper solution um, that if you're managing through other ways like capping, reassignment, or building a new school might not be as necessary as soon as they are. That, that's, a, that's a really good example. There's lots of, I'm sure, not good examples. Um, so, but, but that's a long time between when a school opened and when it gets its trailers. So, so it, Heritage was built and the next year it was capped. Right, so I mean, right from the beginning, it wasn't really sufficient space, and we've been rezoning people ever since, right? I think that's why Rollsville High School was built so quickly. In, in Timber Drive, which we mentioned earlier, where we are actually removed with Marcella Go, which was uh, great to hear, and, and you know how I feel about that, Marcella. We've had some discussions about that particular school. Had we built permanent space there, then we would just have the capacity sitting there that we weren't using unless there was, you know, some reassignment plan or something to, to change that. But in that particular case, it did allow us some flexibility. And there's, there's also something to be said about um, planning for trailers. And I, you know, I lived in a school that had a modular unit after a while, that, um, but that was a school that was, for example, when you build for a capacity at Rollsville like of 2,200, and you can probably go above that sum before you really start having a, a problem. Um, 
if you're looking if you're looking to build actual additions or more than the six trailers, you're you know you're creeping into a three thousand student high school, for example, or fifteen hundred student middle schools, or twelve hundred student elementary schools. So you're building the capacity that you think you want or need and for the future hope for within the original plan, and you really want to be careful about adding more space, square footage. Another floor, I, I mean, I keep asking why can't we just add another floor to some of these buildings, <laughs> right? Can't they just stay in the first two floors and add the third floor? Um, which I know that would be incredibly disruptive, but um, instead of always building a new school or looking towards trailers. I, there, I think the, the questions are fair and we need to really think broader around what our options might be. Um, so that is the answer. Insufficient, and so amazing. So, just bringing up Heritage High School, for example, um, they you're never going to see that school empty. <laughs> I mean, they're running out of room, and we have any. There is eight apartment buildings that are going up right. I mean, they all walk to the high school, so that'll fill it right there. I mean, we we actually need another high school up there, but just putting trailers in there, I'm just saying like. I think that's going to be a permanent space. And it may not be the same for each and every one. And you know what you're saying might be completely true, that some places don't have the space or the need for it to be a permanent solution. But And we had a conversation some months ago, maybe last summer, about um, on an elementary school site, we typically identify a space for mobile units, for, for mobile units. We have run across some sites where it would be prohibitively expensive once we built the school to put the mobile units in. So there have been discussions and considerations about going ahead and building that permanent square footage in because we know we couldn't do it later. And some sites might not support a trailer. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So what is the cost difference between like extension and is there a ballpark? Um, I wouldn't give you a number right now. That's something we can research and so, bring so back that to that. That would be an example of like if we put this on a future committee meeting, that can be some back. of the stuff that you can request and then they can come back and do a comparison. Yeah. Are there other questions related to trailers that folks have? I, I wanted to support that as an agenda item. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Strickland, is, I was been in his ear about one of my schools this afternoon. So, um, yeah, I would love to see that as an agenda. Sammy, you had a question yeah, too. Let me ask you something because I want to make sure it's not. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think if it's a land acquisition, it's still in that stage. It would be that's more real estate contracting. That's probably closed. Okay, I'll wait for that, a certain that point. Question. Yeah. We'll get clarification. Okay. But better to ask before we just right, put it out right. there. Um, but similarly, you know, one of the things that relates to this, and I don't know if it would go into a trailer presentation or might be something that just stands on its own, but Ms. Coffey and I, we've been talking about how long it takes to build right. a school and how, you know, just for someone looking at it, you can see a commercial, design, commercial development go up in like a year, two years, but we have a much longer public process in terms of how long it takes to get their design, to bid, to actually construct it. And it might be informative for the committee and the public to just sort of like walk us through in a public building process why it does take as long as it takes. So for example, like with Rollsville, by the time we plan the school to the time we build the school and it opens, it can open and be, be full. We saw that with uh, Parkside Elementary. Remember we had some people that were opposed to the reassignment that in that first year when we purposefully opened it at reduced capacity, were you know, talking to us about, well, see, you open the school and you can't even fill it, and today we're capping kids out. And so just maybe kind of some more explanation at some point, whether it's in a trailer discussion or standalone, just to like let everybody know why schools take this long to get from you know, the need and the decision you know, to purchase the land and build the school until we can actually open the doors for students it might be helpful. I, I make it a loose analogy that uh, you know, a, a, a big box store or a Walmart or something is just that, a big box store. And you, you can make some comparisons between building schools and, and say hospitals in that there are lots of spaces interior 
to the building with lots of different uses, so they're much more complicated buildings. Um, in all cases, I would say, uh, both commercial and with the school business, it takes a long time to get things permitted and approved. Um, it just, you know, to go through the approval process, it's a, a, a long, thorough process, and it takes a long time. Felton Grove, for example, there's exactly, one. Yeah. Any yeah. school, any school we're doing, takes a long time. But do we have the same difficulty? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do we have the same difficulty with um, renovation projects or like? They have to be permitted. You know, same thing. Repairs, same yeah. thing. Same thing. Signage. You know, you have to get it approved. Just even like walking us through that process, sort of a day in the life, so that folks can understand what goes into it, might be really helpful. Okay. Do you have more on trailers, or would you like any other topics? Any other suggested topics? No, I, I'll okay. let the trailers go. <laughs> but uh, like you see, I mean, there's a lot of interest. Everyone had some questions yeah. about it. So even with the 101 to go back, there's still other ideas. And I, think I just think as far explore. as safety, just facility being more efficient, I just think it's more proactive. Um, and just having the idea of this, it just seems very disconnected. And there's, there, there's a lot of like specific pros and cons, right? Like we've had municipal pressure sometimes not to put trailers at certain schools or pressured us to remove trailers, but then when they've experienced capacity issues, like completely reversed on us. Right. You know, I've seen that in my district where they wanted the trailers gone, and then when they saw how far their kids were going to be capped out, they're like, no, 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 let's see if we can't get you some trailers. Right. So, yeah, it just a, a lot of things that'll take like probably like a good hour or so in the committee discussion to flesh out. So if you don't have any more specific topics, Sam, I know that you had some. And oh, I just, segments. you want you can go first, I'll go first. Sure, um, the only one that I've, uh, that, and again, we're always talking to a parade. I know Bill Fletcher used to say that all the time. So it's not just for us, but I think it's good to revisit these issues for the public too. But I'd like us to have a conversation as, you know, we are, and I've heard, Ms. Parker, I've heard you say that land is getting harder and harder to come by, um, and we are going to continue to grow. And so I'd like to have um, a discussion about where we might could get creative without naming specific sites, but talk about repurposing, you know, vacant buildings, that kind of thing. Um, again, not to pin us down on, you know, we're going to open a school in this, in the, in the old Crabtree Mall. Yeah. Like, nothing like that. Yeah. Um, but just sort of that global, big picture discussion of how, looking 10 years down the road, how we may have to look at getting creative mm -hmm. in that way, where we won't be able to get the land needed for... I know, like, yeah, because we'll get citizen suggestions all the time. Hey, there, Cisco has these mm -hmm. empty buildings. Why can't mm -hmm. we use that as school space? Or, and I know for some of our alter, uh, alternative schools, we have been able to use some commercial space um, for that purpose. But for like a bigger traditional school, you know, there's a lot of restrictions. Sort of like, what are the pros? What are the cons? We have a land acquisition 101 on the forecast as a topic coming up. Is that something that you think could be a part of that? Maybe as an extension. <clears throat> Sort of just some ask staff specific that. questions. I mean, if they felt like that would be an appropriate, you know, time to discuss that, it'd be fine with me. Oh, but, uh, address any of your questions? I think it may be helpful, for example, to provide examples of where we have done it mm -hmm. um, to help sort of spur the conversation about how that could be more sort of long term incorporated into the work. Because there are pros and cons to it. That's and I think it'd be helpful that. You know, if you kind of have some specific examples of some questions, maybe to forward them and share. And you can actually route everything to me, and then I'll forward it to staff to send out to everybody. But that way, they're not like trying to guess what we're thinking. And at the same time, you know, if there's like an area that you know already, there's no need to go and explain that one. But maybe target it on what you do need to know. Sure, I think it would be helpful also to know um, in that 101-ish. Yeah. Um, if it's in county, and I don't know if this is a question, which way to direct the question, but if it's in county lines or in city limits, mm -hmm. um, and it might be different for, for you, Mr. Hershey, but I'm not really sure where you are, but I know up in Wake Forest, there's like a lot of lines. 
So like mm -hmm. you can go up to like Avery Ferry Road and on the other side you still might be in Wake Forest but you're in Franklin County. Like, you know, so I'm not really mm -hmm. sure how that looks, but I do know that we're running out of spaces up there. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I think that's appropriate, right? Like different jurisdictions sure. and challenges yeah. or just like, to understand. So, yeah, some of those are very simple. We can't build out a county without legislative approval and approval of the joint county. But there is Wake Forest and then there's Wake Forest in city limits, so I'm not sure how that how that works out. Right. It's the difference in the TJ and corporate loans yeah. and county loans. So I'm happy to address all of those questions. Anything you can think of in Wyoming. Okay. So like for example, like northern Wake County with the watershed, there's other issues up there that might be good to yeah, throw into that. Okay. All right. Is that yeah, kind of on that? Yeah. And then Mr. Hershey? Um, the only thing I have, and I've mentioned this to Mark, is I was sent an article saying that the Treasury Department is going to um, give guidance on how we can get direct payments for energy incentives like solar. and but. I don't want to keep beating that drum if it's not financially. I don't know what the dollar amount we need to get from them mm -hmm. and grants to make it worth our while to do. So if there's any kind of energy analysis costs, I would appreciate that. If that's easy, I, I assume you guys have all, a lot of numbers anyway. So I, I said in some previous meetings, uh, we talk with the county all the time about uh, Courting meetings about uh, <coughs> sustainability and solar is big on their list because they are further ahead than we are on yeah. solar. So we've committed that this next group of projects will be solar ready. Right. And um, you know we, we don't with solar there's a cost, a first cost. Right. So we didn't have that worked into the budgets, but we are trying to work it into one of the projects that we will be getting design on um, soon. When I say soon, next <coughs> right. year. So. You know, I'm that's just Just because it's in my district. Yeah. I can't help it. So, okay, yeah, but it's, I, you know, if we can get direct money from the federal government, I'm all about you it. Have some I'm going to send it to you. I just wanted to, because I hadn't shared it yet. Yeah. So. so, if I can oh. build on that, or do you have more on that one? Um, or do you have new ones? No, this, I mentioned something to Mark okay. already, so nothing. I want to I want to build then yeah. on your idea. Like, we've talked several times about sustainability. Mm -hmm out to share goal for many board members. You know, one time we had a consultant that came in that was sort of pitching their services to develop a sustainability plan, and there were pros and cons with that. But the idea that I think, you know, some of us have talked about, like the idea of the district having a sustainability policy, and that would be something that's obviously cuts across a lot of different departments. You know, I think I've talked to our policy chair, and she's had interest in initiating some of the conversation over there. But then what that would look like, what would go into that, would obviously rely on a lot of our, you know, a lot of the people in this room. But for facilities committee, the idea that, you know, we could have a presentation just about what sustainability initiatives the district is already looking at and employing. I know Ms. Sharp has talked to us on the design front about a lot of the things we do very intentionally, right? But then in terms of like maintenance and operations, if there are solar ready buildings, is this something that we're doing? Are we looking at other, you know, improvements in terms of energy efficiency and power? We've talked about, Sam talks about um, grants, grants available for electric vehicles, for fleet vehicles. And then, you know, again, there's some challenges with Wake County. We run like bus routes a lot further than a lot of school districts that might only be you know, the buses might just be going like a five mile loop and they're done. Um, but really kind of touching on a couple of these areas, sustainability and design, sustainability in our operations, sustainability and things like our fleet. And just, you know, being able to present that all in one piece, I think would give the, the, the public and the board a good orientation of what we've done already. And that can help inform us in terms of developing a sustainability policy so that we can set some goals and look for you know where we can have energy efficiencies, cost reductions, and some of these there will be you know there will be a cost increase, and that gets back to our you know our uh, model costs, right? And then sort of seeing you know this is what we'd like to do, this is what it would cost, and then these are the sacrifices that would be required. You have to choose between A and B, but really identifying those and being real upfront about them. So it's one thing to set aspirational goals, but 
if we can show where, for example, we've seen with some pilot projects on composting, where we could have potential savings, right? And that there could be savings for the district. So then maybe that's an area to prioritize versus some other things that we'd like to get to, but maybe it's a more phased approach to get there. Does that sound like something we could so bring we, back? So we, we've done a sustainability 101 kind of sort of with the core team presentation that you and Nate did. So we, we've already done that. Then yeah. We can tweak that and add to it and bring it to a future meeting. Perfect. Um, we do a lot of stuff that maybe you don't think is sustainable, but it really is in the realm of, of what everybody considers to be sustainable. Um, so yeah, we can we can bring that back. Okay, perfect. All right. Anything else? Well, if not, then I will thank everybody for their time and we'll call the new business segment and the whole meeting to a close. And again, if you have that perfect question that just comes to you like on the drive home or tomorrow, you know, eating your cornflakes, just email me, let me know. I try to collect them all and they'll forward them to Mark and Douglas and the staff and um, try to get them out there for a future meeting, okay? All right, thanks everybody. We'll call this meeting adjourned. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Tim.